I think the last thing we need from yeah. you is just to um, oh, put on this little Monica? microphone. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I should probably do it all the that way, right? Perfect, yeah. yeah. Okay. Better to do it right below, or is I think right below. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. Good morning. Morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to 
to introduce Tiffany Shaw, <clears throat> University of Chicago, who's going to lecture on climate system. Um, I didn't prepare an introduction. I've known Tiffany for a long time. Um, we've interacted in a variety of contexts. Um, and she's a great speaker, and I'm really excited to hear what Tiffany has to say. Okay, great. All yours. All right, thanks, Jeff, um, for that introduction, and also to Brad for the invitation to be here. Um, I really enjoyed uh, yesterday's lectures. I'm looking forward to delivering mine, and I thought I'd start with a little bit of background about myself and sort of my goals for the lectures that I will deliver. And hopefully I will achieve those goals. So I'm a physicist, but I focus on Earth's climate. So I might call myself a climate physicist. Um, and I got into this having done an undergraduate in physics and math, and then realizing through taking, as you'll see, geophysical fluid dynamics, that I could apply this sort of mass macroscopic knowledge to explain emergent phenomena at the largest scales on Earth, okay? And so I've developed these lectures so that you can kind of follow me along to see how we can use physics, okay, to understand climate. And that climate is a physics problem. Um, and it's obviously a very important one from the context that we know about climate change and it being one of the most important scientific questions of the 21st century. What are the impacts of climate change? Where will they manifest? How large will they be? When? So all of those questions can be tackled with physics. So in lecture one today, my objective is to set the stage, which is to say, show you the emergent patterns we see in Earth's climate today. So time average today, no climate change yet, and begin to deconstruct how we can bring physics to bear to understand these large scale patterns, okay? And as we've seen, you know, physicists like to think of two, two terms, the balance of two terms. So I'll get into that today. I'll develop the equations of motion. I'll talk about dominant balances and I'll try to break down the patterns into different regimes, which will be very helpful for my second lecture when I'm gonna sort of sketch out solutions uh, in these regimes to then ideally explain what I'll show you here the motivation from observations. And then really all of this uh, is really going to come together in my third lecture. I've kind of reverse engineered it that way. The third lecture will focus on climate change. Okay. And so all that you've all that we've developed along the way will be brought to bear to explain the patterns, the predictions that sophisticated models uh, of based on physics, but with large, you know, uncertainties, enclosures what they tell us and whether we should believe them, how we can use theory and our understanding of constraints from physics to have confidence um, in what impacts climate change will bring. Okay, so that's the, that's the roadmap. And so today we're gonna start by just looking at the climate and kind of getting oriented in the dimensions and the equations and so on. So I thought I would do that by looking at um, our best known state estimate of the atmosphere. So this is not a pure observation. This is what we call reanalysis data. So many of you may be aware that when you look at your phone and you look at a weather forecast, you know, tomorrow, two weeks from now, this is a prediction from physics, okay? The same equations essentially, uh, although on a different discretized grid because it's solved numerically. And what's happening is it's an initial value problem. We get the initial conditions from observations, okay? Satellite, land base, the ground base, um, you know, you name it, clever observationalists have, have attempted it. We use those to integrate the equations into the future for six hours. This is the weather forecast problem. At six hours, we look at the prediction. We have new incoming observations. There's a process called data assimilation that blends these together, okay? So it's a mathematical algorithm that does that. And weather forecast continues to predict um, into that two week time frame. What the reanalysis data represents is doing that retroactively using that same data assimilation algorithm, but starting in 1979, which is the so-called post-satellite era. Okay, we have 
the most observations as of that time, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, which of course you would probably know is mostly covered with ocean. So they go and they, 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 they integrate this forward in time with this data assimilation constraint on the dynamical model, and they produce a four-dimensional state estimate of Earth's climate, the weather, the climate, everything. Um, now this is uh, several incarnations in, we have hourly output from this um, over the whole globe. So that's a four-dimensional state estimate. What I'm showing you here is just two dimensions. Uh, I've averaged in time, this is annual mean, and I've averaged in longitude. So what we're left with is latitude on the x-axis and altitude um, on the y-axis. You'll see altitude to the right in kilometers and pressure, which will be a vertical coordinate that I will take advantage of for derivations. It's a very useful one. And the reason pressure can be used uh, as a vertical coordinate is because it monotonically decreases with altitude, something we know from hydrostatic balance. So the main takeaways I want you to look at for this, what is now a temperature map in the annual mean uh, in this latitude height pattern is that, you know, obviously things we already could say before that temperature increases as we move toward the equator, which is here zero degrees, that's North Pole, South Pole, and it decreases upward. Okay, this red um, line indicates the so-called tropopause, the boundary between which temperature decreases with height, and then it changes to increasing with height. I won't be talking about the region where temperature increases with height, that's the so-called stratosphere, and one needs to think about ozone there as a source of, of diabetic heating. Another thing that's kind of interesting um, is that this decrease doesn't really manifest over the poles. It, these polar regions tend to have a stable boundary layer, so the temperature doesn't decrease with height immediately, and we'll talk very briefly about why that's um, different than the other regions. So that's the temperature. I think we all sense that, so I thought I'd start there. But of course, the objective of these lectures is to get into the so-called circulation, so the winds. Um, and I wanted to warm you up here with the wind patterns in the east-west direction. So this is little u. I think that's going to be similar in the conventions you've seen in previous lectures, but I think part of my job will be to make sure I match conventions or at least discuss when I've changed conventions. Uh, from previous lectures. So this is the east-west winds. Um, positive is toward the east, okay? And again, same coordinates, latitude height. So the, of course, the first thing that uh, catches your eye are the, the, the maxima in, in this domain. Actually, there's the global maximum is aloft, but let's just look in this domain. The global maxima are here uh, at about 15 kilometers. And um, these are the jet streams on the order of 10 meters a second, okay? They reside around 30 degrees, so we call these the subtropical jet streams aloft, and these are, the, as I said, the fastest winds. Now, what's interesting is if you go downward toward the surface, it's a little hard to tell, but the color bar um, would indicate that just below these regions of eastward winds, the positive, uh, we change sign to negative, so-called westward winds. So there's this vertical shear of the winds, that will be something we'll want to explain as we go forward, but here we're just noting it. Um, and then as we move poleward at the surface, we have these surface eastward winds. And I'm going to have to be careful, there is terminology um, so-called westerly and easterly, uh, and I'm going to try to avoid using that because it's kind of confusing. Those ter that terminology indicates where the winds come from. I'll try to stick with eastward and westward, which is absolute direction, positive, negative. But if I slip, which I may well do, please feel free to ask for clarification. So these are the really strong west. This annual mean, all days, since 1979. Also the same, yeah. So I don't, you know, given the constraints of three hours, four and, four and a half hours, three lectures, I'm gonna stick to the annual mean, okay? But, um, in the notes that I've given you or the references to the, the chapters in Vallis, which I see someone has brought, <laughs> which is a very heavy textbook. Um, so I've given you PDF, thankfully. Um, there is some discussion of seasonality. And yeah, as we unwrap dimensionality in time and in space, longitude here, you know, this is the richness of the problem that we start to ask questions, um, especially for climate change. Regional climate change is certainly one of the um, important research areas of interest. Okay. Yep. Yep. 
is low over the poles. It's actually a little warmer. Yeah, so, so the temperature decreases with height. And that's just due to, to leading order, the dry adiabatic lapse so rate. Yeah. Right, so it, it depends on what's controlling the temperature, which we haven't got into, okay? So convection dominates, as we'll see in lecture one, in that region where you reach this cold point tropopause. As you move away, uh, what we call macro turbulence or more like two-dimensional turbulence starts to control the temperature structure. It's not purely sort of radiation and convection. There's more ad role of advection, yeah. Okay, so this is a linear field, so it's well justified, but we'll see later on what's manifesting here is a consequence of nonlinear equations of motion. And so we'll start to attack, <clears throat> as I said, the role of turbulence, two-dimensional turbulence primarily driven by Rossby waves. Anyway, all of that will come, but this is just a linear quantity, but yes, the nonlinearities influence this um, and we'll get there, okay? Especially for the winds, that'll be one of the main um, takeaways in lecture two. How do we get these patterns to emerge given the physical constraints that we'll bring to bear? So that was the east-west winds, just the, the U component. And then we've got the north-south winds um, and the up-down winds combined together here in a mass stream function. Okay, so of course we can, using this uh, stream function, take derivatives of it and relate that to the um, north-south motion. If we take the vertical derivative and up down motion, if we take the horizontal latitudinal derivative. So what this shows is air rises near the equator. And this is units of kilograms per second, 10 to the nine. It flows poleward and then it sinks. Okay, so that's thermally direct. Okay, and then it, it, it recirculates upward here. Um, and these two cells have names, Hadley cell and feral cell. So of course the question is, why does the Hadley cell terminate around 25, 30 degrees? That's something we'll seek to answer. Uh, tomorrow morning and you know what dictates this what seemingly is a um, thermally indirect circulation that manifests a uh, pole word of that the so-called feral cell and here's where the eddies will, the um, these nonlinear fluxes will come into play from the deviations of the mean are very important here so that's just foreshadowing we'll get there but what I want to do to start is of course to say how we're going to how are we going to understand all of this, right? Well, what we're going to bring to bear um, is our understanding of physics through geophysical fluid dynamics. And so I'm sort of assuming, you know, fluid dynamics in my lectures, which, you know, Grisha did cover. So that's great. And what I'm going to do is build off of that knowledge through the conservation laws and add in the rotation, which is obviously extremely relevant here and also um, the stratification, which is what we saw, temperature varies with height. It's not uniform in the atmosphere. So geophysical fluid dynamics is a study of rotating stratified fluids. And it is the physics that we can bring to bear to understand large scale uh, emergent patterns of the circulation in the atmosphere, which will be what I cover and also in the ocean, which um, Baylor Fox Kemper will cover a couple of weeks later. And the building blocks of geophysical fluid dynamics are the constraints that we bring to bear from conservation laws of applying conservation laws to treating the atmosphere as a fluid. We think about it as you'll see as an ideal gas. And so what I thought I'd start with is just to enumerate those systems of equations that represent um, those constraints. And I think I've, you've all probably seen my notes. So what I'm doing here is just going over those. And when I have gaps that I purposely left for exercises, or we'll say, you know, I can't sketch out full solutions, as I said, Valis is there to fill in the gaps. So it's a balancing act for me when I want to get um, to the punchline, which is climate change. So we're going to start with the equations of motion. And as I said, these represent the constraints, and we'll enumerate them starting with momentum, then we'll do mass, then we'll do equation of state, then we'll do energy, all, all the time, taking into account how many unknowns, how many equations. So we have a well-determined set um, 
and you'll have to trust me that the, the equations that I'll show you conserve angular momentum, conserve energy. These are the fundamental things we need to ensure. So for momentum, what we are doing is we're setting up a spherical coordinate system as shown in this diagram. This is just, of course, a hemisphere. We've got the hemisphere, um, which you know, is truly a full sphere, but just shown as a half for purposes of illustration. And it's rotating. Um, omega is the rotation rate. And we're assuming that's constant Okay, throughout what I'm going to show you. That's not true over Earth's history. Okay, And paleoclimate is a really interesting additional topic in climate physics that's not what I'm going to have time to cover. Paleoclimate is the past where we do have variations of Earth's rotation, right? But for the purposes of these lectures, omega is a constant, okay? But of course it varies with latitude as we'll see. And we've got longitude is lambda, alpha will be my latitude, and then Z uh, is altitude or pressure. I'll um, sort of use those interchangeably. And we have then three components of the wind. We've already seen the observed uh, emergent structures for those. U is east-west. It's a line along a line of constant latitude. V is north-south along a line of constant longitude. And then the vertical velocity uh, is up-down. Okay. So we need, and I'm not going to use tensor form in my equations. I'm going to go full on <laughs> momentum of each component. And so that's what I'm going to do now. The first component is our east-west momentum. And in the convention of ballast, I'm going to follow the material derivative as a capital D. Okay, so I think we should use lowercase d. Here we're going to use capital D. So that's the conversion. Beware of that. And I'm just going to write out the equation. And I'm going to remark on the terms that have been added in the, in the context in which, in, in why they've appeared. Because some are familiar and some are new. Some come about because of rotation, but some have always been there. OK, so the, this is the east-west component. We'll just think of it as the x component. And the things that, of course, we've seen before are the material derivative, the pressure gradient force, OK, here written in spherical coordinates. And then we've got something that um, depends on Earth's rotation vector, the, um, the magnitude of that, omega. This is the Coriolis acceleration. OK, and we all know that as we transform to a rotating reference frame, we get these fictitious forces as we um, do so. And this is one of them that manifests. And it depends on the position, latitude. OK, so that's just through trigonometry of the cross product of um, omega vector cross B vector. OK, so this is just that x component of that cross product. And then we have a term that comes after that, which is associated. We call this the metric term. And that's associated with the fact that our unit vectors are now also in a rotating frame. And when we take account of that, um, we get, this term can be traced to that. Um, transformation okay so i'll spare that's all very easy to derive i i don't think that's super enlightening if you do want to see it as i've said valis goes through it very nicely in his chapter two okay now let me continue with my other component this is now the y component and this looks very similar but we've just um, you know carried through in the case of the coriolis parameter the cross product in the y component, and now we have the component in y of the pressure gradient force. Okay, and then finally, the vertical component. Okay, that's, that's the z component. Okay, and I meant to do this here. The same reasoning applies here. Okay, uh, but we've made an approx some approximations here that I want to um, mention. Okay, so there's some approximations that have been made and they have been taken in a consistent way such that we preserve 
uh, the conservation laws of angular momentum and energy that we want to have, you know, low post set of equations. The first is that we have a shallow fluid, okay? So the atmosphere on Earth is like a credit card. The vertical extent H, the vertical scale height is very small. As you saw, uh, that red line of the tropopause, if you paid attention, was about 10 kilometers, you know, plus or minus. Okay, A, which is the radius of the Earth, is 6,000 kilometers. Okay, so it's like a credit card. Length scale in the horizontal is much larger than the length scale in the vertical. So there's an anisotropy that we exploit here uh, to get rid of, in particular, some of the terms associated with the Coriolis force applied to vertical velocity and other metric terms that have been neglected um, in this dot, dot, dot. Okay, another thing you may ask is what happened to the centrifugal force? Well, we've, you know, done a little trick there, which is to say um, we define a gravity vector that's an effective gravity, okay? That's the sum of the, the regular gravity, which for us is just constant. We're not going to worry too much about deviations um, beyond the radius of the Earth. It's just small deviations at that point. So that's the standard gravity. It's constant, 10 meters per second squared. And then we've ab absorbed, um, yeah, let me just make sure I get that right. Yeah, omega squared, our perp, the centrifugal, uh, into this effective gravity because it just depends on position so we can act as like an effective uh, potential. Okay, so it is there, it's just, you know, built into the definition of gravity. All right. So that gets us going. And we can take stock now of what we've got. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I chose to have these two boards and right here, instead of having this display with those boards to write. Maybe I'll change tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the pressure gradient itself vanishes, so that takes care of that. Yeah. Yeah, then as you go over the pole, the velocity over the pole vanishes. Yeah, so you've got, yeah. So these are the Navier-Stokes, I meant to also say these are the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, there's no friction here. I meant to say also that we're going to just... Um, friction is obviously important and I will address it, especially when I get into what's happening at the surface. But what I wanna build up today is just essentially the, what we call free atmosphere. So above the boundary layer. So friction hasn't appeared. We'll also see that um, we'll get these deviations about the mean, what I'll call eddies, but um, you know, the, what we can call turbulence if we want. And yeah, that can also be sometimes thought of as an effective diffusivity or friction and, and so on and so forth. So it's, 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 I'm not ignoring it because it's not important, but certainly as I relegate myself to the upper atmosphere, it's not something that I'm gonna treat to leading order. Yeah. Oh, little a is the radius of the earth. Thank you for that. And I also wanted to say that in this coordinate system here, although R is not explicitly shown, R is our vertical coordinate, and it's really the sum of two parts, right? So A being the very large 6,000 kilometer radius of Earth plus Z deviations from that. And so this approximation where I've got an A in the denominator, I've replaced what has been an R, uh, replaced that with an A under that same um, approximation, except when I take derivatives, of course, because I can't do that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the convention here is positive, so one can, yeah, yeah, positive. Uh, it depends on your unit vector definition, yeah, in R. Okay, so, so far so good. Oh, I wanted to mention taking stock. I've got three equations. And how many unknowns? Uh, anyway, I wrote it down, but like five or something? Yeah, five, or no, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five unknowns. 
So that is U, V, W, Rho, P, five unknowns. So not a good situation to be in, which means we gotta keep going. Okay, so things are gonna have to keep being erased because of the choice I made about the projection. So let's just keep going. So the next one is mass and mass is an interesting one given the fact that we've made an assumption that omega doesn't vary in space. Mass is an easy one. It just carries over identically from the inertial to the rotating frame. So that's helpful. And by that, I can just write the conservation of mass equation that you would have seen in just you know, non-rotating fluid dynamics. This is Cartesian. But as I said, for derivations, there's something that's really nice as a theorist, and that's to use pressure coordinates. So that's where I'm gonna kind of go here. And in the pressure coordinate system, the conservation of mass equation becomes a divergence-free criteria. That's a pretty easy derivation. You're just taking the material derivative of rho times some material volume, some fluid element, which I should have mentioned is how we're driving this to begin with. And if you use hydrostatic balance, um, you can easily drive this divergence free criteria. Now, omega, which I need to be careful, it's not W, it's omega, is the vertical velocity and pressure core. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go to hydrostatic balance in a minute. And for Earth's large scale circulation, this is, well, a very good approximation, as we'll come to. But yeah, I'm, I put the cart in front of the horse a little bit there. Uh, so thank you for making that clear. Hydrostatic balance, which I just, oh no, I didn't erase. Of course, we could all have seen just from this, right? And as was mentioned, that would have to have this be neglected. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. So pressure coordinate is um, going, let me just write it out. So we're going from x, y, z to x, y, p. Okay, so it's only in the vertical and it's a very easy transformation to make and well posed because pressure is monotonically decreasing. Okay, so yeah, X, Y, Z to X, Y, P and it's a very standard transformation. Now it does make use of, as was said, hydrostatic balance. Okay, and you can see that just in the, what I erased in the, definition of hydrostatic balance, you've built in this transformation between P and Z. Uh, what do you mean by scaling? I mean, we'll scale the equations to reveal hydrostatic balance in a minute. Yeah, so, so hold that thought. Okay, yeah, sorry. When it's, um, when it's here, it can, but here it can't. So now it's an independent variable. So, right? Here, yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, um, pressure coordinates will take some getting used to, but it's actually not that complicated. You just have to recognize that pressure you know, I can make this transformation. Yeah. Yes. So what happens to the pressure gradient force is that it no longer depends on, in the pressure coordinate system, no longer is the pressure gradient force explicitly dependent on pressure. Um, but now it's, as we'll see, dependent upon Z. So it'll be gradients of Z, Z, that will, which are, can be written as a, as a potential capital phi, which will take that place. 
So yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, I can do that. It's not that hard, but if, why don't we do it? We're here. We'll do it. So let's do hydrostatic balance first. Okay, so I can define then this easily. So hydrostatic balance in height coordinates now becomes a derivative of the geopotential, the gravity, which is constant, times height, which now varies with pressure. Okay, and that's just, you know, flipping it around. So what happens to the other term, which needs to be addressed, which is pressure gradient force in the horizontal. Then we've got both X and Y can be shown. And I'm kind of, I should be a little more careful with my coordinates, given that I chose to introduce spherical coordinates. Um, and maybe that's, you can see it a little better. So now my pressure gradient forces are written in terms of also phi, but everything else remains unchanged. Of course, my material derivative and my advection now has a, uh, a different vertical derivative. It's no longer geometric height z, but it's, um, it's the vertical derivative is now the pressure derivative. But otherwise it all carries over. Now, the sleight of hand of course is there's no free lunch, right? So it all seems great to a theorist to now have a divergence free condition for mass, but that's, you can't hide the complications of, of the full equation in Cartesian coordinates. So where the complication goes is to the, bound, the surface boundary condition. Okay, and since I'm ignoring the surface for now, that's of course easy, but again, there's no free lunch. So one has to now address that the surface boundary is now varying in time and in space. So that complicates, that's where the complication um, ends up being built in. Within the free atmosphere, we do get this divergence-free criteria. Okay. I think that's good. Now, I think the only thing I wanted to say was where we are at in terms of equations and unknowns. And I think now we're basically at four and five. So four equations, five unknowns. So making progress, but not there yet. Okay, so I said we got four equations, so three for momentum, one for mass, but we still have five unknowns, the same unknowns as before. We haven't introduced a new one, so U, V, W, Rho, P. So we keep going. The next one on my list is the equation of state. So relating thermodynamic variables to one another. And here we're going to, uh, yeah, use the ideal gas law. Okay, so obviously this assumes certain things, thermodynamic equilibrium and so on, and that's all well satisfied as long as we're within this, you know, region of zero to 15 kilometers. Things break down if you go too high in the atmosphere, that's not where we're going. So in climate science and atmospheric science, the way we write this is pressure equals density times R times T, which is not maybe the way you've seen it. PV equals NRT or something like that is probably the way you've seen it. So how do we do that? Well, it's built into this definition of R. Here's the ideal gas constant. And it's divided by the molecular mass of our atmosphere, capital M. So we have um, um, joules per mole, and then we've got mole per kilogram. So all the units work out. And of course, that's where the specifics of our atmosphere have to be incorporated. We have 80% nitrogen gas in our atmosphere, 20% oxygen. So that's how we come out with the value for R. And yeah, that's how you can start understanding as Earth's atmosphere has changed composition in a substantive way. Uh, you know, you can study the variations of the Earth's composition uh, through this impact on that on that R. Again, that's very much a paleo climate thing, but useful nonetheless. Okay, so where are we at now? Five equations, but unfortunately six unknowns. 
because we've introduced T. So U, V, W, or omega, um, P, rho, T. So that's where we're at. And now comes the big one, which is conservation of energy. First law of thermodynamics for an ideal gas, because that's the assumption we're making. So presumably you've seen that type of thing before. Now we're applying it to this fluid setup. Gas. Okay, so we all know what the first law is, which is, of course, that internal energy plus the work done has to equal heat added or some kind of diabatic effects. So when we go ahead and translate that into our fluid parcel, we can write it as follows. The specific heat of constant pressure times the material derivative of temperature. That's a manifestation of the internal energy. We've made some um, algebra, done some algebra there relating internal energy, which is typically CVT, but that can be related to CP through the CV plus CV equals R and so on. And then we have the manifestation of work, which is here written pressure dependent. And then we have the right hand side. So in Vallis, he kind of just says Q. But I think some of the state of the art climate science that's going on is trying to not do that and be a little more explicit about the role of moist processes, the fundamental role of moist processes for Earth's atmosphere. And where the rubber hit the road also is climate change, because one of the fundamental things that we understand that will happen with warming is that air will hold more moisture. And we would like to understand how that constraint can carry over. To the circulation. So I'm going to open up the <laughs> doors on the right hand side here. Um, and so let's go. What's the most important heat added is the latent heat due to condensation. Okay, so this is the latent heat of vaporization. Or water vapor. And this is the condensation uh, rate taking place anywhere within the atmosphere. And then there's a bunch of other stuff, which I'm gonna write here in flux form, but not specify the exact closure for this, which is of course, because it's not trivial. And you know, if I had many more lectures, I'd be happy to get into radiative transfer. This is radiative transfer. So the fact that the gases in this atmosphere will interact with UV visible infrared radiation, converging, diverging energy as a consequence. <clears throat> so that's adding heat, losing heat. And um, the next term here is what I would call conduction, but only of temperature. And really where this plays the most, the most important role is right near the surface. So the, the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean, you can think of that as sort of a downgrade diffusive process. Um, so it's really just dominant uh, down there. Okay, so a lot of possibilities of how we can add heat. Now, um, one thing I want to say is that if we're allowing for condensation, we should also keep track of, 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 of the vapor in our atmosphere. This is the so-called specific humidity. which is the kilograms of water vapor over kilograms of dry air. So it's unitless. And of course, if we are condensing, we're losing vapor, um, releasing latent heat, and of course, you know, accumulating water. But one of the easiest ways to sort of upgrade a model that is adiabatic, excluding all types of heat added, is to allow there to be, so that would be a dry adiabatic situation, is to allow for condensation due to water vapor and create what we'll refer to as a moist adiabat. So we, we don't worry about sublimation, we let that be associated with heat added. 
But what I'm working toward here is building in an energetic, total energetic equation that includes, uh, builds in this condensation due to latent heating. Yes. Capital Z is the condensation. Great. So how much, where is this conversion happening? At what rate in time? Okay. And of course, that's, we know that's going to be associated with convection. I'm not going to get more explicit than that here. That's a whole, if you're very interested in atmospheric convection, which again, I cannot cover in four and a half hours, there's a very nice textbook by Carrie Emanuel, which goes into all of those wonderful details. I'm just trying to scratch the surface of bringing in moisture um, in a more kind of inclusive way, okay, into the overall system rather than just writing Q. So this is the first step toward doing that. So the goal is, of course, to create a total energy. I've written the energy so far. I want to expose a little bit the dependence on potential energy, and in doing so, kind of reveal that kinetic energy is really not a leading order. Whoops, really not a leading order contribution. Okay, to the total energy, which does scare some people, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, so that's built into the, 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 the L and the C. Yeah, dimension in a dimensional sense. Yeah. Okay. So I want to um, extract potential energy. Okay, so of course, we're all aware that there are conversions, but you know, to get a total energy, what we're needing to do is accumulate the conversions between these different forms such that when we add it all together, we develop the conservation law. So one step toward combining or um, exposing the dependence on potential energy through the capital Phi potential, geopotential that I defined is to work this pressure uh, material derivative. Okay, so how do I work it? Well, first I just take it and remind myself that what this pressure material derivative is equal to by definition is the vertical velocity and pressure coordinates. Nothing controversial there, but it's also equal to when we take the uh, expand the material derivative, the Eulerian time derivative at a fixed position, and this is now Cartesian, so we'll have to be careful. This is the two dimensional horizontal advection, and we've got the W advection for Cartesian advection. This is, these are all just equal to each other by definition. What I'm going to do now is argue just through you know, expert knowledge. The scaling here is that this is about 10 Pascals per day. This is about 10 Pascals per day. I think it's actually 10 to the two. And this is about 10 to the four. So you can see sort of what I'm doing is scaling the equation to drop some terms. And what this is implicitly going to do, this is a, a conversion term, okay? That is often, well, that is important for connecting potential energy to kinetic energy. And what I'm gonna do is drop it through a scale analysis, okay? So what I've done then is said, well, okay, approximately how this is gonna work out is as follows. And then I can make use of hydrostatic balance and then I can make use of, which is always, this is all equal to dpdt. So I'll keep writing it minus rho g dz dt standard w is the vertical velocity in Cartesian coordinates. Okay, and so finally I've done it because this is minus rho d phi dt because uh, phi is gz potential energy, how much energy it's required to lift one kilogram of mass up to a height z. Okay. So I made a note that this is 
the assumption here, the scaling uh, implies that we're going to, we have basically scaled out kinetic energy, which is not to say that it's zero. Remember, this is just small. So that's an asymptotic kind of approximation. I'm not doing that formally here, but you can do it formally. And that's what happens. So there's always room for kinetic energy. And indeed, you could drive the full thing with kinetic energy. But for what I'm interested in, as we'll see, it's not going to be essential. Again, ballast will cover that for those interested. OK. So that means the first law becomes on this journey of trying to have like a material derivative on the left-hand side, which in pressure coordinates is a flux form because of the divergence free criteria. We've got CPT dt dt plus d phi dt. The density cancels out, the minus sign becomes a positive. And then we just continue with what we had with our heat added. The right hand side remains the same. We can combine these terms now to define what's called dry static energy. S is the dry static energy. So S equals CPT plus GZ is the so-called dry static energy. Static because there's no kinetic energy here, at least not explicit. Of course, it's in the advection. And then the final step is to combine with latent energy. So that will be all of our energy together in form of internal or enthalpy, potential, and latent. So how do we do that? Well, we just add this dry static energy to our equation for that specific humidity, which represented um, the opposite, the loss of condensation. So we can um, combine with the latent energy, where the latent, of course, refers to the latent heat of vaporization, and define the following. This is an error here. So M now has it all, CPT plus GZ plus LQ. This is the so-called moist static energy. So this is the thing that's gonna be, you know, conserved. And we could build a moist adiabat, for example which excludes sublimation and any other type of heat added. Okay, and so this is definitely a leading order effect that we're including. Again, for the purposes of um, treating moisture holistically and not external to the flow. That's something that we still struggle with in GFD, geophysical fluid dynamics. So I kind of wanted to show you that. Okay, so six equations, six unknowns. And we can define those as U, V, uh, W, P, rho, T. We could also put M there, given the relationships that we've built. Um, we're basically, everything is fully determined. We have the same number of equations as unknowns. We can also show full angular momentum conservation, something that we'll touch upon next lecture as we look toward solving these equations. So that's the equations of motion you know, in whatever number of minutes it took me to do that. Yeah. Hydrostatic balance, you've left out the inertial gravity. Is that in the atmosphere? On large scales, yes. Small scales, no. So that's the short answer. The equations that are solved numerically, like as I'll get into, yeah, I mean, Certainly like weather models, when you're trying to capture small scale things, you incorporate that holistically, but yeah. We're taking advantage as we'll see, that's why I'm gonna to get to next of dominant balances. Okay. So dominant balances. <laughs> 
I think as Grisha said yesterday, physicists can only handle two things. So that's exactly what this represents is, you know, we just have a big thing and we want to find the thing that's just big enough to balance it. Yeah. Say, can you repeat that? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think I mentioned that. So this is conduction of moisture. So I still have this like bias toward not of vapor. So this is dominant at the surface. This is evaporation. Okay, we're gonna vertically integrate this hopefully before the end of the lecture. So it's really just the boundary term at the surface. That's where the moisture comes from, right? So that's where it comes in. That's the source. Um, the LC was the sink of vapor, right? So these two things uh, it's just like an advection diffusion type problem, which is a whole other set of lectures you could give, which I'm not going to have time for. Okay. Dominant balances. And we're not going to be sophisticated today. This is like scaling, but rest assured, there's a lot of very careful applied math colleagues who have made all of this very explicit in terms of asymptotics. I'm happy to re refer you to their work, this includes Andy Mida, Rupert Klein, um, a lot of very nice stuff, okay? So we're gonna start with the vertical momentum equation, which of course the dominant balance as we've already been using without being careful is hydrostatic balance. So what justifies this is, is what we're essentially going to do. So we start with our equation, And we do a scale analysis. So give me, you know, to get the dimensions of the first term, I've got vertical velocity. So I choose a scale for that. And I've got a time derivative in the denominator. I'm gonna assume time scales advectively. Okay, so that's L over U. That's the scale of this term. Now, I'm not gonna explicitly scale the pressure gradient. We'll leave it here. Uh, of course, we know what the scale of G is. It's 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so let's go ahead and choose values. So part of why I motivated my first lecture with the actual data is because that's the problem of interest. So we can use the values that we saw to choose these, these uh, representative scales. So let's do that now. I didn't show vertical velocity actually, but you'll have to trust me on that one. So W, this is approximately, this is pretty small, 10 to the minus two meters per second. U, we did see, that was the jet stream. It was about 30 meters per second. So we always work in powers of 10. So um, we choose 10. Uh, G of course is 10 meters per second squared. The length scale for large scale atmospheric flows uh, is 10 to the six. We also can just go ahead and choose the vertical scale height that we might use later. We won't explicitly use it right now. Uh, and that's about 10 kilometers. We saw that also in that red line, that um, triple pause height. And just to be clear that I'm choosing time to scale advectively. So that was built into the first scaling. So you just go ahead and plug it in. What is this? 10 to the minus two meters a second times 10 meters a second divided by 10 to the six meters. And I get 10 to the minus seven meters per second squared, which is much smaller than gravity. L is the horizontal length scale. The horizontal. So like, the, well, you know, it's not that different from A. Yeah, A is, you know, 6,000 kilometers, so that's 10 to the six. So yeah, uh, if I were scaling a thunderstorm, <laughs> obviously L of 10 to the six is not appropriate or a tornado. So yeah, you gotta know what you're trying to explain for scale analysis. What is the phenomenon 
Okay, so that means, you know, the effective term is not sufficient to balance. And so what we, of course, get is that the pressure gradient in the vertical is um, going to balance gravity. So this is hydrostatic balance. That's the dominant term. Okay, so that's no surprise. Definitely something you've seen before. Okay, but let's move on because uh, there's more to come now. We've got horizontal momentum. That's where I'm going now. And horizontal momentum, this is where the jargon starts. <laughs> okay, so horizontal momentum, we have a balance that's called geostrophic balance. So let's go ahead and expose that through scaling. But I'll just focus on the zonal momentum equations, the x component, the y component follows identically. So I'll write it out for you again. And here, I'm going to choose my pressure coordinate just for ease of derivation for the next dominant bounds. Okay, but remember, this is just like swapping phi for pressure. Um, so yeah, there's no tricks here. Okay, so let's scale it. So we have u squared over L, right? Time scales effectively. We have um, two omega sine phi, which we'll call F. Coriolis parameter times u. That's the second term. Third term, we've got two u's divided by a. And then we'll keep the right hand side here. I mean, and it's understood that what, of course, gets things going in Earth's atmosphere is pressure gradients due to uh, absorption of sunlight at the surface. And we'll come to that. But um, so here we are. So the idea is that this has got to be balanced. So what candidate term on the left can possibly achieve that balance? We only want two, it's too complicated to have more. Okay, so we just take the ratio of terms. And we define, in this case, a non-dimensional number. Oh, I should have said here, one thing I didn't. This is also consistent with H over L being small. Anyway, hydrostatic bounds basically relies on large L. So that's, yeah. So, okay. That's a choice I made that's not a good choice. And so if I chose a V, that would actually help me because I'm, oh, this is a square. So why don't we just do that maybe? I'm not gonna use that term. I'm not gonna consider it as a candidate for my dominant balance, but it's a fair point. That's certainly an overestimate. Okay, we could have chosen this to be uv over a, which would make it smaller. Okay, so, but that's not going to be where I go anyway. So, uh, point noted. Where was I? Yes, here. So, the candidate terms are the first and the second. As was pointed out, we could easily just neglect the third. It's about one meter a second, capital V. So, it's Certainly an overestimate it to say that it's the same as you. So we're gonna take the ratio of these. Um, so that's the advective term, the inertial term. This is the denominator is this, the second term. We're trying to get their uh, magnitude, their ratio. What you can, of course, see is that this then becomes u over FL. Yeah. Right. I, I scale time advectively. Um, okay. That's a choice that I made. Okay, so this is a famous non-dimensional number called the Rosby number. 
after Carl Gustav Frosby, a very famous uh, physicist, but also meteorologist. He probably is the only meteorologist to have achieved the following feat to be on the cover of Time magazine. Um, you know, he, he basically was one of the founders of this field. He was extremely important in the war effort, which is really when GFD got going to actually forecast weather. Very important. And we'll see him um, next lecture in the context of solutions to these equations, the so-called Rosby waves. Okay, so what do I wanna say about this? Well, I wanna say what happens if Rosby number is small. Okay, so how do I achieve that? Uh, I can make the, I mean, there's many ways of achieving it. I don't need to go into that, but if it is small, then what happens to my uh, equations up there is I achieve the following, a balance between Coriolis acceleration, uh, there's a minus, go to the top row, not the middle, and pressure gradient force. And the same thing happens, this is the X component, and the same thing happens in the Y component. So this is the geostrophic balance. And so this is quite powerful. What it says is that the wind, the geostrophic wind, typically we would denote that with this lowercase g, is um, flowing parallel to lines of constant geopotential. Seems pretty simple. But it has pretty important implications. If you have a pressure map, or in this case, a geopotential map, you're given iso lines of geopotential. What this implies is that as you move from, for example, high to low, which is the direction you're accelerated toward, okay, then the Coriolis force starts to act. It only acts when you're moving. And if this, this is shown in the Northern Hemisphere, it deflects you to the right, and you begin to circulate in this case around the low, um, whoops, uh, counterclockwise. So pressure gradient, the, the, the dominant balance is pressure gradient force uh, is pointing this way, Coriolis force is equal and opposite. So now you've got the balance um, flowing parallel to these lines of constant geopotential. Okay, so it's pretty simple, easy to draw a free body diagram. Does this actually work in the real world? Ah, yeah, it does. So one thing you always have to, be mindful, meteorologists love to overlay things on top of each other. This is like hugely complicated, but actually showing something quite simple. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the black lines, which are a capital Phi, so-called geopotential. Here it is, geopotential height. Okay, so they've divided by G. Um, on a particular day, 1996, October 18th. And then we're seeing two winds. The way the winds are represented here are these barbs. Okay, the direction is indicated by the, the, the angle, the direction of the line, and then the magnitude is indicated by how many of these barbs are at the end. Don't ask me how and why they do this. This is just what they do. But the blue is the geostrophic wind. So given the gradients of phi, I go ahead and calculate this. I get the, the wind vector based on the two components. This is two-dimensional. You can see the continents, the United States, um, there's the Great Lakes. And then red is the actual wind, what you actually observe, okay? And the key thing you're supposed to see among this mess is that these are often parallel. So, and, you know, if you look at the barbs, it's very close. So not only the direction is well represented by this dominant balance, but also the magnitude. And this is up high. I didn't maybe mention that. This is 300. Um, millibars or hectopascal, so it's, you know, seven kilometers or something, away from friction. So there's no, of course, rule for friction here. Okay, so that's good news. We can even understand that on any particular day. This is a given day, a given time even, um, not like annual mean that I was showing before. So the final dominant balance is just to combine these two which is so-called thermal wind balance. So thermal wind balance, 
is then the combination. Of the dominant hydrostatic balance in the vertical plus geostrophic balance in the horizontal. So this is a pretty easy derivation. So I'll go ahead and do it. Starting from uh, these two equations of geostrophic balance, we take the pressure derivative. Okay, so minus F D V D P. And we have minus one over A cos phi. The second derivative of phi with respect to pressure and longitude. Now we use, so that's just geostrophic balance with a pressure derivative. Now in this equality, I'm going to use hydrostatic balance, which allows me to, and you know, this is classic. I'm not a mathematician, so I'm happy to swap my derivatives. I assume everything um, is well posed and smooth and nothing can go wrong. So I swap the order of the derivatives. I know what D capital phi dp is, that's hydrostatic balance. So I have one over a cos phi d d phi of minus alpha, or alpha uh, d capital phi dp equals minus alpha from hydrostatic balance. Alpha is one over rho, the density. And then the final step is just to use ideal gas. And I can then expose a dependence on temperature, which is what the thermal wind, of course, is um, related to. My two negatives cancel, cos phi, R over P, that's from the ideal gas, dt, d phi, or d lambda, sorry. So now I've got shear in the vertical of the north-south wind is related to temperature gradients in longitude when I combine these two things together. And the same thing holds true when I do it for the other component. Uh, my second component of the, of the geostrophic wind there. This is a lambda, that's an error. D, T, D, phi. So now, the shear of the east-west wind in the vertical, pressure is a vertical component of the, is now my vertical, um, my vertical component. And the temperature gradient now is in latitude. Okay, let's move on to my next plot here, which kind of summarizes what this implies and helps us kind of achieve some of our objectives. So what is implied here? Well, let's start at the surface. This is altitude and latitude. The surface is the bottom. Now, of course, on Earth, what gets things going, and we're sort of sidestepping that for the moment, is solar insulation, right? The Earth receives energy from the sun. It receives more at the equator due to the sunlight being you know, directly incident than at the pole. Okay, so you spread that over a larger area. You also have polar night half the year. There's no sunlight. Okay, so there's more energy going in in low latitudes and in high latitudes that manifests as a lower pressure um, as opposed to higher latitudes being a higher pressure. That gives us the direction of the pressure gradient force, which is from high to low. From geostrophic balance, we can infer the east-west wind would be westward. Okay, so that's geostrophic balance. Now, when we go up, what we have to incorporate is hydrostatic balance. So we have to be um, mindful that pressure decreases with height, of course. If we have an isothermal atmosphere, it's exponential. But it depends on the scale height, which depends on temperature. So how fast the decrease uh, occurs is a function of temperature. If you have very warm and light air, the decrease will be less fast, the scale height will be larger, than if you have colder air that's dense. Okay, so pressure is decreasing with height in both regions, but aloft, the pressure flips because the decrease is faster when you have warmer, lighter air uh, following hydrostatic balance than it is when you have denser, colder air. So if the pressure gradient, if the pressure difference, or the pressures flip, the pressure gradient flips, the 
wind from geostrophic balance, change of sign. So we have basically deduced that aloft, we should expect a, some kind of a, a jet stream, an eastward wind uh, that below is coupled to a westward wind. And that's something I noted in one of the early figures I was showing, kind of motivating these sort of emergent patterns. So this, of course, implies a vertical shear, and all of that is consistent um, with this thermal wind. So, th so thermal wind balance is kind of a leading order explanation for that vertical wind shear we saw in the latitudes around 30 degrees. Okay, but that won't be the whole story, and we'll see more about that uh, next time. Okay, so I'm not going to have time for everything today, but what I'm going to, looks like I'll have time to wrap up with is going to be just what I need, and I'll fill in the gaps of things I couldn't cover as I need it later. It's all about calibrating your first lecture. So what I want to do now is kind of, I guess, riff off of this dominant balance, but be a little more careful and connect more specifically to symmetries in the flow and actually bring in, which was already mentioned, sort of deviations about this mean picture, about just taking averages of linear fields. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right, so the Coriolis force comes in through geostrophic balance, okay? So everything gets going with a pressure difference. Moving in a, but so what, cyclonic, that's right. So the, the so, so that's, <laughs> right, right, right. So that's why you gotta start at the surface. This is just geostrophic balance. So everything can be followed through that. That gives us the direction of the wind just knowing the gradient of pressure. Yes, so that's crucial. So this is altitude. So this is somewhere aloft, let's say 10 kilometers. Altitude, yeah, Z, altitude. So to get aloft, we have to use hydrostatic balance. So how is pressure manifesting aloft? we have to use hydrostatic balance. We know, let's say just from the simplest point of view that pressure decreases exponentially with height. That of course is assuming an isothermal atmosphere, which is not quite what we have, but I think it's gonna give us the correct intuitive picture. On this side where we have the low pressure, we have warm and light fluid. So think of this as near the equator, okay? And so the scale height, of the hydrostatic balance and the decrease of pressure exponentially with height depends on temperature. So if you have a warm light fluid, the scale height will be a lot larger. So it's decreasing exponentially, but not as fast as over here where you have a cold and dense fluid. So now when you examine the pressures aloft, they've flipped. Yes. That's right, yeah. So above, when you look aloft of an anomalously low pressure at the surface, which is connected to warm and light air, there is anomalously higher pressure above as compared to a region in mid latitudes where, or at the pole, that maybe the most extreme would be easiest, where you have cold and dense fluid and you have a much, um, and so then aloft, there's lower pressure relative to that. I'm just trying to see yeah. where's the scaling with F? So it's, it's, it's right here. So the vertical shear implied from this change of sign of the wind, right? From westward to eastward. You know, you can only have this relationship in the presence of non-zero F. So you can't be at the equator. You have to be off the equator. Um, So F doesn't fit in as a height scale, it is going to determine um, in some sense, the magnitude of this, of this, of this shear, of this geostrophic wind. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically valid everywhere, basically, except right near the equator. Uh, as you get right to the equator, there's other terms that come in, that metric term I mentioned with the tan phi dependence, and you get so-called gradient wind balance. Um, there's other nonlinear terms that can get you out of this, the fact that F goes to zero at the equator. But that's not what I'm deriving right here. Yeah, we're not on the equator. F would be zero. Yeah. Okay. So in the few minutes I have remaining, I do really want to get to this part. This sort of notion of regimes and exploiting the axis, axisymmetric, the symmetry we have about the axis of rotation. Okay. So we're going to exploit the symmetry and basically look for um, balances beyond these sort of linear, about the axis of rotation. And we all know that symmetries are related to conservation laws. And so in this case, it's the conservation of momentum. And what we're going to do is exploit the symmetry by taking an average in longitude. Okay, there's not much reason to leading order to consider longitude. As I said, incoming sunlight is not distributed as a function of longitude. It's all latitude. We have the axis of rotation, so like, just get rid of it. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to focus in on the equation that, of course, is connected to angular momentum. And I'll expose that more specifically in the next lecture. But for now, we're just writing out the x component as it was before we took geostropic balance. So this is the full equation. And we're going to take a steady state, explicitly a time average now. And also what we call a zonal average, which is this average that I'll define um, as a function of averaging longitude. Okay. All right, averages and longitude, we define those as, in this case, an overbar. We're going from zero to two pi in longitude. Okay, so we're going to extract the component of every field. In this case, it's, it's, it's the momentum components. When we take this longitudinal average, it's an longitudinal average of a derivative on the right-hand side, so that'll go away. So uh, what we're going to do is do a standard Reynolds decomposition where we search, or we have an, a decomposition of our, of our field U into a part that has no dependence on longitude and a prime which has dependence on longitude. And time is gone. We'll just have to assume, um, I've not defined an overbar or anything, it's just easier to do that. It just gets rid of the time derivative anyway. Okay. So implicitly the overbar is, is a solution, is part of the solution that doesn't depend on longitude. So we're gonna, you know, really get into this next time with respect to angular momentum conservation and kind of expose this more specifically. For now, we're just breaking up the equation and the, the fields this way to, um, to write those parts of the solution on the left-hand side that are only dependent on the bars, are independent in longitude, and then on the right-hand side, as we'll see in a minute, those parts that do depend on longitude. So perfectly, um, I've asked you to show this. I don't have clearly time to derive it. It's not very difficult. You just have to go through the motions, okay? Um, what you're doing is you're plugging in the onsatz of the Reynolds decomposition into all of these terms. Then you're, you're starting, okay, products, average of the products, not product of the average. You just take into that into account. 
go through all of that. And the goal is that you should be able to show the following. Okay, so you collect terms on the left-hand side that are you know, axisymmetric, they don't depend on longitude. And you, everything on the right-hand side now depends on longitude. And so here are the quadratic terms, okay? I mean, there's quadratic terms over here, but the quadratic terms of the deviation from the average, which we refer to um, as eddies, eddy pseudo-momentum flux, uh, are collected there on the right. Since we're really interested in what's happening, for example, uh, aloft, so away from the surface, and um, in particular in the vicinity of the jet stream or where we had the Hadley cell and its termination, and then there was this change of sign to have a ferro cell, we're gonna restrict ourselves to the upper atmosphere, or the upper troposphere. So that really just means like 10 kilometers where, the circulation is really outflowing in the in, in, in V. So omega is basically zero. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Zeta. Thank you. Is vorticity. The vertical component of vorticity. So vorticity is the curl of the wind. This is the vertical component but we've also applied the averaging in longitude. So we don't have a longitudinal derivative. We only now have latitude. So it's uh, the shear in latitude of this U bar component. Next time we'll see how this is related to angular momentum advection, but for now we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. It's omega. Yeah. So I have a pressure derivative here. So this is, Omega, this is omega. Once we're um, up at this level, everything is you know moving out. So it's mainly U and V, not U and omega. That helps us. And um, if we then write this out, essentially what we're doing is dropping the terms proportional to omega. Okay. Almost there. So we're going to see those sort of dominant regimes in here by just defining a Rosby number that looks a little bit different than before, but would scale the same. So zeta bar over F. So this is the ratio of what we call relative vorticity. So vorticity that we have due to fluid motion depends on U bar divided by F, the vorticity we have because we're on a rotating planet, okay? It scales the same way as U over FL, right? Vorticity is the derivative of U, so it's like U, of, so it all scales the same, no problems. And um, if I go ahead and take F out of this equation, I have one minus, the Rosby number times V bar. And then everything on the right hand side is the same. And so what this exposes is a dependence once again on the Rosby number. And that this is what, where I will end. So I've got two limits or two regimes as we'll call it. Of the Rosby number being large or order one and the Rosby number being small. So if the Rosby number is order one or just say one or you know, like bigger than one, then we can essentially satisfy this equation by assuming the left-hand side is zero, okay? Now, if that's not the case, then what happens is the regime would emerge of having the Coriolis acceleration being related to these, this eddy pseudomomentum. And of course we need a closure for that. 
like that'll be the whole subject of part of the next lecture. And, and of course, how does Ros mean number vary? Well, latitude is a good thing. F varies with latitude. So that's one way of thinking about this. And I took the liberty of revisiting this uh, plot of the east-west wind, but now in the vertical black lines are not meant to be some strict thing, but just to distinguish this latitudinal phase space as a function of Rosman number. As we move toward the equator, we're getting toward this limit uh, of this regime of large Rosby number, F is going to zero. And as we move away from the equator, we get into this regime here. So this is gonna set us up nicely for next time as we try to, using this information, kind of expose the solution as to why we have a Hadley cell that terminates and then something else, the so-called ferro cell happens poleward of that. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, you can do the same thing with energy, which is the last little bit of the lecture notes that I provided, uh, which is, I would say, newer stuff. But I think it's a very nice way of kind of partitioning this domain into uh, potential different solutions or way we could attack solutions. And for the energy, it helps with the temperature. For the angular momentum or the zonal wind uh, momentum equation, it, it allows us to partition this zonal wind domain. Okay, so I'm going to end there and uh, stay tuned for part two tomorrow where we try to solve, uh, sketch out some solutions. Yep. Um, it's just it's just multiplication. We factored it out. Hmm? Uh, so it, it the Rosme is in here. So it's going like to so as um, as you go toward the equator, f you know goes to zero. The that intuition is coming in through the Rosby number. So yeah, it's a little. It's dependent on the Rosby number here. Yeah. Uh, I think over here was first. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> right. Sure. So maybe I'll summarize it this way. Geostrophic balance had nothing to do with advection, right? It was just F times V, F times U, balance V per short gradient force. This balance includes the nonlinear the advection, right? So that comes in. Um, maybe it's not quite clear. It comes in through this. There's a zeta bar and a, a V bar. And it also comes in here as the manifestation of advection of these deviations from this, this uh, longitudinal average. So they're not the same thing. You're including the role of advection here. Um, and so, yeah, we'll kind of harmonize this tomorrow where we say thermal wind gives us this, but it turns out that's going to have problems. So we're going to have a it violates what's called height, height theorem. So we're gonna have to address, you know, why the Hadley cell exists and also uh, build it on this dominant balance and really target the focus of that. We'll be targeting why it terminates. What does that termination depend on? Uh -huh. Uh, so thermal wind didn't have advection. We do have it here. But then we dropped vertical advection at some point and just tried to focus ourselves in the region where W or omega was zero. So this sort of outflow region around 10 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I'm still confused about the working and the market. 
Uh, eddies are not weak at the equator necessarily so um which is assumption anyway the point is okay so the rosby number let's just say it's going to one okay that'll be easier not just because just like go to one maybe that'll be easier just to change all of that okay this is zero this is not zero so it's all satisfied right zero equals zero great now what does that mean about this that's what we want to understand how does it constrain the Hadley cell, which is manifesting this northward flow or poleward flow aloft in the descent, ascent and descent cell. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the vapor flux at the surface, so-called evaporation, which is just conduction of water vapor, uh, does not appear in this equation, right? Okay, so in the notes, there's a basically a little bit left that I didn't get to, and it sort of treats that more specifically in the context of how that balances other dominant terms in the energy budget, right? But this, this is just momentum balance, in particular angular momentum balance. To, to, to observe evaporation. Is that what you're asking? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to, yeah, absolutely. But the focus of what I'm trying to do today, as I said, was to kind of explain these features uh, aloft. Uh, it turns out also at the surface, that'll come a little bit later. Um, and so the machinery I need to do that does not involve the boundary layer. Now, to, tomorrow I will talk a little bit about the boundary layer because surface winds will have to involve the boundary layer. And I want to explain those. So that will come into the picture tomorrow. Momentum balance in the boundary layer. But for this, it's all above. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the very plain, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not going to get into, so. Basically, F, you can create a tangent plane approximation. You can tailor series expand it. And so to leading order, it would be F is a constant. And then you'd have this dependence uh, on latitude that we I'll introduce actually tomorrow, the beta effect. So yeah, you can revisit these dominant balances in the presence of the beta effect. And indeed, that's what you have to do as you move toward the equator. So that's another way it comes in among other terms, like I talked about gradient wind balance. Yeah, so all of these balances that I've been describing have been outside the tropics or, you know, subtropics, out, outside the equator, let's say, which is obviously, um, I'm not going to, there's a fascinating field of, um, you know, these waves in the tropics and, and so on and so forth, but I just don't have time to cover that. But if that's of interest, I'm happy. I think one thing I'd really like to do is based on your interests, you know, I can suggest review articles, things to get you excited about studying climate. So please don't hesitate, you know, to ask for such things if you want the more formal asymptotics or tropical, whatever. Yeah, just let me know.
I'd be happy to provide that additional information. Mm -hmm. mm, good question. So the question was, why, for example, just by the labeling of the contours, why is the jet stream subtropical jet stream 30 meters per second and then in the southern hemisphere, that's the left versus the northern hemisphere, which is 25 meters per second. Um, we just wrote a paper about that. It, so sometimes like people assume things, but it's never really been documented. Uh, so what you might expect just intuitively, it might have something to do with the boundary conditions. And indeed, that's sort of what our paper shows. What are the boundary conditions? Well, obviously, there's a land ocean contrast. That's a surface heat capacity effect. But what it came down to more in our paper was um, the role of topography, which I think surprised a lot of people, um, but also the ocean. The ocean is very, well, the Southern Ocean, it's Southern Hemisphere is mostly ocean. And those two ingredients seem to be sufficient. And um, how we leveraged an explanation of that, or at least evidence to suggest those were the primary factors uh, was to come do what I do in my group most often, which is to say, what is going on with this observed thing? What can theory bring to bear? So in that case, we didn't bring to bear momentum specifically. We really leveraged a lot of the energetics because of the surface boundary condition was a little easier to deal with. And then we did simulations. So kind of the three-pronged approach where you can take a model of the Earth's atmosphere, which has uncertainties, but you know, you can flatten topography, you can um, change the surface flux over the ocean. So the energy given to the atmospheres. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think the best approach in climate physics is one that takes those three, doesn't ignore this complicated stuff, but combines the understanding from the theory and then also the modeling. And so I'll hope to show you that approach is really in the same vein as Manabe, um, Suki Manabe, who won, who was awarded part of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2021 for his work on climate physics. So I'll talk a lot more about his approach on Friday morning. 